The James Webb Space Telescope was always set to revolutionise our understanding of exoplanets, planets in orbit around other stars in our galaxy, the Milky Way. And in particular, it was designed to collect the tiny amount of starlight that passes through an exoplanet's atmosphere on its way to us so that we can work out what the atmosphere is made of. Now, this is easier to do the bigger the planet and the thicker its atmosphere, which is exactly what people started with. They were learning how to do this with Jade Wrist T with planets that were the size of Jupiter or Neptune. But we all know that the dream is to do this with rocky planets that are Earth-like, that are also in the habitable zone around their star, the region where it's not too hot and not too cold for life to flourish. But to do that, we have to find them first, which is where the TESS mission comes in, the Transiting Exoplanet Survey Satellite, whose sole job is to hunt for new exoplanets. Now, thanks to the TESS mission and its predecessor, Kepler, we've just passed the milestone of 5,000 thousand confirmed exoplanets. But the majority of those are the big planets that are easier to spot and the smaller ones that we do find aren't guaranteed to be in the habitable zone. So of those 5,000 exoplanets that we know of, only 60 of them are thought to be both in the habitable zone and small enough to be rocky Earth-like planets. Which is why there was a lot of excitement this past month when this paper by Dransfield and collaborators was released announcing the discovery of not one, but two rocky exoplanets in the habitable zone around their star. Now the first one, they're really sure of the detection, but the second one, they're not as sure. But if it is confirmed with more follow-up observations, it would be the smallest habitable zone exoplanet found by TESS to date at just 6% larger than the Earth. So before we dive into all of the gritty details, let's chat a bit about how TESS actually finds exoplanets, because there is a couple of different ways you can do this. In last week's video, we actually talked about a method called direct imaging, but you can also use the radial velocity method, or as I like to call it, the wobble method. I went through all of these in my History of Exoplanets video. If you wanna know more, I'll link that video in the description below. But TESS and its predecessor Kepler used what's known as the transit method. Monitoring stars for regular dips in their brightness because a planet has passed in front of that star on its orbit from our perspective here on Earth. Again, this is a lot easier when you've got a big planet or one that orbits very close into its star or both because either way that planet is going to block more light causing a bigger dip in the star's brightness. This is why so many exoplanets we know of are hot Jupiters. Jupiter sized but orbiting very close to their star where it's much hotter because they're just easier to spot. Plus, if the planet orbits close into its star, then its orbit's gonna be really short. It might only take a few days, weeks, or months to make one loop of the star, which means that you're only gonna have to wait a few weeks or months to see that planet pass in front of its star again and confirm that dip in brightness that you saw was actually due to a planet and not some variation in the star itself, like a, like a star spot. That's why it's so hard to spot Earth-like planets around sun-like stars that are in the habitable zone, because for them to be there, you have to have a similar orbit to Earth and so you have to wait around for a year to see that very very faint dip in the star's brightness again to confirm that the planet is there and we're talking about a tiny fraction of a percentage of the star's light for that dip in brightness. So that's why the majority of habitable zone rocky exoplanets that we know of have been found in orbit around M-dwarf stars. Stars much cooler and smaller than the sun, around about 10% of the sun's mass. Being smaller stars, it means that the planets block an overall larger fraction of the star's light. Plus to be in the habitable zone, because the star's much cooler, it means they have to orbit much closer in. And so their orbits only take yeah, a few weeks or months, which means you don't have to wait around very long to spot the regular pattern in the dips of the star's light that they cause. For example, the famous TRAPPIST-1 system of seven rocky planets are in orbit around an M dwarf star. There's a lot of unanswered questions though, when it comes to whether planets in orbit around M dwarf stars 
stars would actually be habitable. Like there's some people that argue that M dwarfs are just too active and that they can flare huge amounts of high energy radiation that would just irradiate a planet, maybe even completely strip it of any atmosphere and make it completely inhospitable to life. But then there are other people that argue that those flares could actually be the catalyst for biological processes that are needed to kickstart life. We're not going to know which of those scenarios is the right one though, unless we find more planets in orbit around M dwarf stars and try and study if they are habitable. So it's a good job that Dransfield and collaborators have done just that this past month using TESS. So they were monitoring a star called TOI 715, which is a fairly nearby star. It's in the direction of the constellation Volans in the Southern Hemisphere. So here's the brightness data for TOI 715 over a monitoring period of about two years. The gray dots are individual measurements and the purple line shows the average of measurements taken over like three minute intervals. The red and green triangles at the bottom show this pattern of where they think the transits of these two exoplanets have happened. Now it's impossible to actually see those transits on this scale by eye. It's only when you take the data and like fold it at the time the planet takes to orbit so that all of the transits line up that you actually get a strong enough signal which is then what's shown here. Again the grey points are the individual observations and so you can really see how crazy noisy this data is but if you average the brightness in these 15 minute intervals you get these pink outlined circles. Transfield and Collabs then model the transit, working out what effect the planet would have on the star's light if you change its size and its mass and its orbit distance. And they get a few possible models that fit this data that are all shown there in the pink lines. Now the best fit model for this planet that they are very confident of TOI 715b is that the planet is 1.5 times the radius of the Earth, orbits its star every 19 days, and from the amount of starlight that hits it, has an equilibrium temperature of 234 Kelvin or minus 39 degrees Celsius. That temperature is worked out assuming that the planet like doesn't have an atmosphere. If it does, it's obviously going to be a lot warmer than that. You can then do the same for the other transit pattern that Dransfield and collaborators found. Again, with the gray showing the raw data points and the green here showing that averaged data. But you can see it is a lot noisier. So they're less confident in the detection of this planet. But again, you can fit some models, that's what's shown in the green lines there. And the best fit is that this planet is 1.066 times the radius of Earth, orbits its star every 25 days with an equilibrium temperature of 215 Kelvin or minus 58 degrees Celsius. Since they're not as confident of this detection, this remains like a candidate planet for now, one that will have to be confirmed with follow-up work, which means it sadly doesn't get a name and it just gets stuck with this long number designation instead. Now the temperature that Dransfield and collaborators have calculated puts this planet and this planet candidate well within the habitable zone around their star. So the next question is, can we use JWST to study their atmospheres? Can we work out what the atmosphere is made of and therefore like what is the surface temperature of this planet? Is the atmosphere thick enough to support life? And are there any molecules present in the atmosphere that suggest that life might exist there? What we know as biosignatures. So Dransfield and collaborators calculated something called the transmission spectroscopy metric. It's essentially a measure of how difficult it would be to do this. The lower the number, the more difficult, the higher the number, the easier it would be. And for JWST, we need that number to be above around about 12 for us to be able to study their atmospheres. So you can see in this plot, the TRAPPIST-1 planets that are plotted here in yellow just about make it above that cut. So for everyone that keeps asking like, where is the TRAPPIST-1 data from JWST? We want to see it because there's these Earth-like habitable rocky planets that are in the habitable zone that we want to study. It's coming, it's just really, really difficult. You need to observe many, many transits because their metric is so low. And many transits, when JWST is busy doing other things, you have to time it properly and they obviously don't happen every day. So but good science just takes time. And I want it to come out to these results, okay? But it, it will take time. The blue points are other known rocky planets, but the points to look at here are the pink and green ones. 
the pink points are for that confirmed larger planet, TOI 715b, which could be a rocky planet with a very thin atmosphere, giving it a very low metric, meaning that JWST would probably have to observe at least five separate transits of this planet in front of its star for us to be confident of any detection. Or a water world with a thick atmosphere, giving it a high metric, meaning JWST would only need to observe one transit to detect something. Or it could be somewhere in between that, we just don't know without more data. Being much smaller, the other candidate planet is likely to have a very thin atmosphere, meaning its metric is quite low. So it's likely that any follow-up studies will just focus on TOI 715b for now. So these results from Dransfield and collaborators are so exciting. You know, finding these promising looking planets is the first step to characterizing their atmospheres with JWST. And maybe, just maybe finding an elusive biosignature, these hints that life might be present in a planet's atmosphere. They were monitoring a star called TOI 715b, which is a fairly nearby star. It's around about 80 million light years. No, not million. <laughs> Try that one again. How far was 80 light years away? I'm just so used to like galaxies being millions of light years away. You just put a million in there. <laughs> Uh, and it's in the direction of the constellation of Volans in the Southern. I realize I've just never said Volans aloud before. <laughs> Don't drop your iPad, kids. You know, I want to sing a song, but TOI 715B doesn't really roll off the tongue and fit into many lyrics. You know, like, it's the life on TOI 715B. Actually, that kind of way. <laughs>